Hey, Chapel Street Church. I'm excited to talk to you about something called Rooted. Some of you already know about Rooted. It's been part of our church for a number of years now. Uh, several years ago, we were thinking and praying about, if you ask the average person who's part of Chapel Street what's next in their spiritual journey, we had a thousand different answers. And we felt like we needed one clear next step. And that's what Rooted has become. It's a 10-week journey through the gospel and scripture built around experiences. That's what makes it unique. It's not just study and filling in the blank answers. It's built around experiences through 10 weeks in community. There's a serve experience, there's a prayer experience, and these things combined in community help change people's lives. I've talked to many of you who have been deeply impacted by Rooted. Uh, some of you who are mature believers might be thinking, well, this is I've already passed this. Not so, it's for you. If you're a brand new believer, it's for you. If you call Chapel Street your home and you're looking for the next step in your life with Christ in our community of faith, Rooted is exactly for you. We encourage you to take part in it. There's a new round of Rooted groups launching very soon. So I wanna encourage you, if you call Chapel Street your home and you're feeling like God is moving you to take a next step in your faith in the new year, get involved in a Rooted group. Don't take my word for it. We want you to hear from those who've been part of it. I came into Rooted having just graduated from Wheaton College a few months before. And while I was at Wheaton, I was surrounded by great community. I was in a great place spiritually and relationally and was honestly thriving. And then I graduated and in a lot of ways, it felt like that community got taken away. So then I joined a sub 30 Rooted group, which was, <laughs> one of the best choices I think I've ever made. Just getting to know a group of people who were the same age and stage as me and just being able to open the Bible together and talk about these foundations of our faith together was such a cool experience. There's the prayer service, there's serving, there's strongholds, there's um, where a week where you talk about giving and that's very important. You you bring God into every facet of your life. I think the biggest takeaway for me was I thought I was okay, just me. And I'd go to church on every Sunday and I pray and I do my devotions and and I felt like I was I was still okay. I was walking. But now knowing that there are other people that I'm that are holding me accountable, that I'm holding them accountable, that I can go to them and ask for prayer, that has has really increased I guess my desire to be more like Jesus. If you are even thinking about Rooted, I would encourage you to go for it. I know that there might be some unknowns about the people in your group or about the things you're gonna be studying. You don't need to come into it knowing all the answers. In fact, I think a lot of the conversations that you have will be more fruitful if you're able to be in that space of not knowing all the answers, because that's when you're able to have really rich conversations with other people as you wrestle through things. That's part of the beauty of this community that you're building. So if you're on the fence, go for it. It'll change your life in the best way. <laughs>that's Emma Crucial. I've known her since she was a little girl and you I feel like we should send that video of her testimony to Rooted and say listen just use this girl to talk to you about uh, how great it is and so uh, maybe fall is the time when things launch around here in school in our lives and so if you're thinking about I, I want to get more connected in my own faith to other believers Rooted is the perfect step we encourage you to take advantage of that as we approach uh, the fall because it's for you and as Paige said for where you are so we're going to begin our sermon with something we occasionally do with the reading of scripture I've asked Jan Bowsman to come and read to us from the Word of God, and I want us to stand together as she comes and reads to us out of the book of Proverbs, God's Word. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Proverbs 10, 19 to 21, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Proverbs 10, 31 to 32, the mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse. Proverbs 12, 17 to 19, whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, 
But a false witness utters deceit. There is one whose rash words are like a sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but a moment. Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a glad word, but a good word makes him glad. Proverbs 12, 13 to 14, an evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous escapes from trouble. From the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good, and the work of a man's hand comes back to him. Whoever guards his, oh, uh, uh, Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 15, 1 to 2, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. Proverbs 15, 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 1624, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Proverbs 17, 27 to 28, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a good spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. Proverbs 18.4, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Proverbs 18.6-7, fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to the soul. Proverbs 24.26, Who whoever gives an honest answer kisses his lips. Proverbs 24, 28. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive your lips. Thank you, Jim. Reading of God's word, you may be seated. I love hearing God's word read. I love hearing it read by Jan because she reads it better than I do. As you probably guessed, we're talking about the wisdom and our words from the Word of God. There are over 150 verses in Proverbs alone about our words, about speech. So it was a challenge to pick a few that we're going to focus on and try to get to the heart of the matter. I am aware that my words are wholly inadequate to communicate God's Word on our words, if that makes sense. Uh, but words are, you, you know this without me telling you, words are important in our lives. Just for a moment. Blink reaction, if I were to ask you, what are the best words you've ever heard spoken to you? I do, I will, I love you, I forgive you. What were the, what were the best words you've ever heard? You're gonna have a baby? What would they be? You don't have to say them out loud. What if I asked you what are the worst words you've ever heard spoken to you? You probably got another list as well that you carry with you. It's amazing, isn't it, how sometimes uh, a, a single harsh word from someone that's dear to us or important in our lives can resound in our mind louder and longer than a whole list of words of blessing. It's amazing how words stay with us. We are surrounded by words all day long. Not just words that we speak, but words that we read, words that appear on screens. Women on average speak 17,500 words a day. Men on average speak less. <laughs> About 12,000 words a day. Still a lot. So many words. Words spoken, words heard, words written on pages and on screens, posted online, written over our hearts. And sometimes it's hard to know which words to trust in our culture. Where, where do you turn to for the right words to speak or to hear? According to Proverbs, how you use words 
how you speak and the wisdom of your words will make or break your life. Proverbs 18, verse 21, we saw this a moment ago. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life in the power of the tongue. That sounds kind of extreme. I mean, maybe there's good and bad. Maybe there's uh, building up and tearing down, but death and life, really? Yeah. We teach kids the saying, right? At least we used to. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That is so untrue. It's patently nonsense. Words do hurt. Not according to Proverbs, uh, words have profound impact for good or for bad. There's a kind of word hunger in us, even if we're not aware of it. Longing for the right words to say, I just dropped my son off, uh, and he, you know, he's been an undergrad and law school. We moved him to Houston. And it was weird because this college is like, make your way, son. Law school, good for you. But they were nearby, and he's not permanently gone. Now it's getting real. Like we, we flew to Houston, we moved him away, and he's out. And I busied myself making, uh, doing Ikea furniture, which I had other words for that. Uh, not the Swedish words, but my own words in my head, right? My blisters on my thumb for the dumb Allen wrench. I put together five or six pieces in, in, in four days for his, his apartment. But then it was over. I busied myself, right? Then it was time to leave, to go to the airport, my wife and I, and leave him. And I was, I'm a man who, my business has words, and I'm grasping for the words. What do you say to your son when he's like, he's out, out, you know? How do I communicate what's in a father's heart? We hunger for words, words to say and words to receive. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's a movement in popular psychology today still that tells you, it doesn't matter what other people say about you. It only matters what you think and say about yourself. That is ridiculous. It does matter. It does have an impact. This brings us to the power of words. And the power of words Words, I think, in a way, they clothe and they embody our thoughts. You know, something becomes more real when you speak it, right? You think something, but once it's spoken, it's out there. Once it's written down, once the email is sent, once it's posted online, it it's, has a different kind of life and power than if it's just a word in your head. You say something, it becomes more real to you. And you cannot ever really take words back. We, we say things, oh, I was only kidding. Or I take that back. But you can't once the words are spoken. They reveal something about our hearts. Remember the Old Testament story? Those of you that have read the Bible before, you may know this. There's a story of the Old Testament about Jacob stealing the blessing of his father Isaac from his brother Esau. I relate to Esau. He was the older, hairy uh, son. (laughs) Uh, Jacob, the smooth-skinned mama's boy who stayed in the tents. The younger. He steals the blessing. The blessing is a verbal blessing given by father to son, to the firstborn son. And Jacob deceives his father who's dying. He's old. He can't see. He's blind. He doesn't hear well. And his, he, he's tricked into thinking it's Esau. And he speaks the blessing. Esau comes in and wants the blessing and finds out his brother stole it. And haven't you ever wondered, like, why doesn't Isaac, when he realizes he was duped, just say, oh, I take it back. I'm going to speak it now to you, Esau. Just words. Because they're not just words. In the Hebrew mind, once spoken, those words of blessing have been enacted. There is something happening now. You can't just undo that. It's been spoken. Life and death and the power of the tongue. Look at Proverbs 12, verse 18. Like one who's, who's, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. You know the phrase cutting words? Comes from Proverbs. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. The power to heal, the power to cut deep. My dad tells the story about when he was in fifth grade and his fifth grade teacher caught him carving his initials in the, we used to have desks. Back in the day, children, we had desks that you sat in and lifted the lids and then he was carving his initials underneath there and inking them in with a pen. And his teacher saw it and said to him, Joseph Frazier, you are dead weight to the world. He tells that story still today. I don't think he believes that, but they stay, those words stay with you. Proverbs 15, verse 4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. 
These two Proverbs make the same point about the power of words by using contrasting statements in like inverse order. Now remember, the power of words, uh, this is important for us to understand. Some people will say, yes, death and life and the power of the tongue, that means you can manifest your own reality. You can speak something and it becomes real. Name it and claim it. I declare it and it is so. That is not what Proverbs is saying. That is not what the Bible teaches. The power of words does not mean you have the power to speak your own future into existence. It does mean that your words have tremendous power to give life or to destroy it in your own heart and in the heart of others. This brings us to the character of our words. The character. What, what kind of words should we be saying? If we're gonna apply wisdom to our words, what, what should they be like that we should say and receive? What kind of speech do we need to receive and need to give? Four kinds of speech, we'll walk through them briefly. Uh, you, can, you can jot these down and, and look through these texts later. Uh, honest rather than deceptive. Kind rather than careless, direct rather than gossip, and timely rather than impulsive. These show up over and over again in the book of Proverbs. There are other themes, but these are some of the main ones. First, honest rather than deceptive speech. You might be thinking, yeah, yeah, of course I want people in my life to be honest and we should tell the truth. But it's talking about something much, much deeper than just truth telling. There's a kind of truth telling that really isn't kind at all. We want people in our lives and us to be able to tell the truth with a gentleness and a kindness and a clarity of spirit. And deception destroys community. Think about it. We, we talk about this, right? There's an election season coming up. I don't know if you're aware of this, but you will be soon if you pay attention at all. And we're going to hear all kinds of words about all kinds of promises from all kinds of sides of every issue. And deception, when you, when you don't know what words can I trust from a candidate, from a government, from those in positions of leadership or power, from those that are, that are you know, news media outlets, when you're not sure in a society if you can trust any words at all, it leads to the destruction of that society. Inevitably, it's a breakdown. And that's not just true on the community, societal level, that's obviously true on the interpersonal level. How can you have a relationship if you just don't trust anything the person says? I'm not sure if that's what they really think, if that's what she really means. I'm not sure if I'm getting the whole truth here. Proverbs 24, verses 26 through 28. Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. That's an interesting phrase. because You might think, well, what? Um, in, in the ancient world, if someone was an equal of yours, you greet them with a kiss on the lips. If someone was of higher rank, you would kiss them on the hand. So when Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, it's a kiss on the hand. He's higher, he's his rabbi. So what's it saying here? A kiss on the lips. An honest answer, truth telling, is a, like I'm, I'm treating you as an equal. I'm not standing above you or below you. I'm coming to you on your level. That's what it's saying. In verse 28. But be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. Of course, we want people in our lives and we want to be the kind of truth-telling, honest people. Second, kind and gentle words. I, I remember uh, the movie uh, Bambi. <laughs> that dates me a little bit. Remember what uh, Mama Rabbit says to Thumper the rabbit? Anybody remember this? It's just me. This is just my weird, nerdy childhood. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. The trouble is that sometimes the silent treatment is worse. Some of you know what I'm talking about. The cold shoulder, the silent treatment, there's speaking volumes without words. Kind and gentle words. Doesn't just mean always say nice, sweet things. Proverbs 25, 15 says, through patience a ruler can be persuaded with a gentle tongue and you can break a bone. The Hebrew phrase literally means you can, um, you can break down the hardest resistance with gentleness and with kindness. Look at verse, chapter 15, verses one through two. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of the fools pour out folly. A soft or gentle answer turns away wrath. Notice the comparison here between soft answer and harsh word. The soft or gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The word for harsh is the Hebrew word meaning to inflict pain. So it doesn't just mean say nice things. 
or soften the blow with your words. It means even when you speak the truth and you speak it directly, you're doing so not in a way to inflict pain, but your tone and your context is because you care, motivated by love. I once had a leadership coach that said to me, you know, Jeff, as a leader, you have to remember that to be unclear is the same thing as to be unkind. You ever think about that? To be unclear is to be unkind. We need clarity, honesty, direction in, in our lives with kindness. And sometimes, how many of you have ever shaded the truth, avoided saying what, you, what the truth really was, or been a little less clear than you could have been because you thought it would hurt somebody? Anybody? If your hand's not up, you're not listening, or not honest, right? <laughs> we don't want to hurt somebody. But actually, to be unclear is being unkind. So we're less clear in order to be kind, but we're not being kind at all. We're holding back that which someone needs, the truth. Now, I've noticed that if you're a truthful and a direct person, you tend not to uh, be so good sometimes at the gentleness and the kindness. But on the other hand, some of you who are by nature very gentle and kind uh, and caring, you tend to avoid at times being direct or telling the whole truth. We need both in our lives. We need to receive the truth communicated in love and kindness. We need to speak it the same way. And that is such a rare commodity in the world today. Third, we need direct or apt words. Direct words. The right word for the right moment. The lips of the righteous, Proverbs 10.32 says, are know what is fitting or acceptable. Look at Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. The right word in the right context at the right time, fitly spoken. The Hebrew word there means according to, in accordance with. With what? With this person's needs, with this situation, with this moment. Not just, I told you the truth, now it's your business. Deal with it. But in a way that is hearable. So imagine with me for a minute uh, a husband who comes from a family where nobody ever says exactly what they mean. Anybody relate to this family? People talk around it, they hint at it, but no one ever says what they really think and really feel. And when you get together in that family, there's, there's a lot of niceness, but there's also some hidden issues going on. Imagine now a wife who comes from a family where everyone says whatever they think all the time in loud voices, right? Imagine these, this man and this woman get married and start their own family and start to talk to each other. And they're trying to import their own learned patterns of words and communication into their relationship. And she says, you never told me that's how you felt. He said, yes, I did. No, you didn't actually. Or maybe she's, she's saying whatever she feels all the time and he's shutting down because he can't hear it. The point is a word that's direct but is fit, apt. So the, it, so the truth that you speak is hearable by someone else. To think about what does this person need to hear and how do they need to hear it? And how can I say it? You certainly want that coming back to you. I know I do. Fourth, timely words. Mark Twain once wrote that the difference between the right word at the right time and almost the right word at the wrong time is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. It's a huge difference, in other words. Uh, Jan read this a moment ago, uh, Proverbs 10, verse 19, when, when the words are many, transgression is not lacking. Do you follow that? When there are lots of words, sin is, is right around the corner. The more you talk, the more likely you are to say something stupid or hurtful. That's a sobering thought for somebody who speaks a lot for a living, who every weekend is using lots of words. But words sometimes... Not just the right word at the right time, but is there, is there time at all for this word? Proverbs 17, verses 27 through 28. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. By, con by conversely, when he opens his mouth, he reveals the truth about himself that he's a fool. How many of you have ever had that experience? As soon as you say something, Oh no, words are coming out. I gotta stop them, but they're out there. And I've revealed the truth of my ignorance or my hard-heartedness, my cold-heartedness, my insensitivity, whatever it is. 
we should ask ourselves, is this word honest enough, kind enough, clear enough that it should be spoken to this person at this time? Let me say that again. A good question to ask yourself is, is this word honest enough, kind enough, and clear enough that I need to speak it to this person in this moment? Sometimes the better part of wisdom is what you don't say. Remember Job's friends in the book of Job? Bildad the shoe height. I won't tell that joke. You probably know it. Shortest man in the Bible. There, I said it. The shoe height. Did you get it? Anyway, his friends show up when Job is suffering. And for a week, they don't say a word. They sit with him in the ashes. And it's exactly what he needs. The rest of the book, they start to talk. And it goes south from there. They reveal that they don't know. Sometimes the best words are the ones we don't say. What if all your words this week were recorded and played on out loud right now in the room for everyone to hear? Every word. Every word you wrote, every word you thought, every word you spoke, all your words was just recorded and played. How many of you would say, that'd be great. I'd love for everyone to hear that. All your grumblings to yourself, all the words you say in your car when you think no one's around. Jesus picks up on this theme in Matthew 12, and he says this, this a profound passage here. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You probably heard that phrase before. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is a sobering passage. There have been times in my life I wish it wasn't in the Bible. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means when you say something, you're revealing something about what's really in there. And you're kidding yourself that you think you can say, well, I, I didn't really mean that. That's not how I really feel. Actually, it probably is. At least in that moment. You will give an account for every careless word. When he says out of the heart, we tend to think in our culture that heart is like the emotional center. This, oh, I love it with all my heart. The feelings. That's not what the Bible means by heart. It means the control center of your life. The core reason why you do what you do and say what you say. That's your heart. Out of the overflow of that place, the control center of your life, the mouth speaks. Jesus says, if you have word problems, speech problems, they are really heart problems. All of our problems with what we say have to do with what's in here. There's something wrong here. So in other words, willpower is not enough. It's not enough for you just to say, well, I'll just try really hard not to say the mean thing I'm thinking. Or I'll try really hard to force myself to say nice things when my mind is and heart are full of not so nice things. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm gonna read to you a poem by my favorite living poet. His name is Malcolm Geit, G-U-I-T-E. He's British, he looks like uh, Gimli and Jerry Garcia had a baby. He, he is uh, uh, bearded and funny looking, but a brilliant poet. And he wrote a, a poem called, What If? What if every word we say never ends or fades away? Gathers volume, gathers way, drums and dins us with dismay, surges on some dreadful day when we cannot get away, whelms us till we drown. What if not a word is lost? What if every word we cast, cruel and cunning, cold and cursed, every word we cut and paste, echoes to us from the past, fares and finds us first and last, haunts and hunts us down? What if every murmuration Every odious oration, every oath and imprecation, insidious insinuation, every blogger's aberration, every Facebook fabrication, every Twitter titivation, unexamined asservation, idiotic iteration, every facile explanation drags us to the ground. 
What if each polite evasion, every word of defamation, insults made by implication, querulous prevarication, compromise and convocation, propaganda for the nation, false or flattering persuasion, blackmail and manipulation, simulated desperation, grows to such reverberation that it shakes our own foundation, shakes and brings us down. Better some words be lost, better they should not last. O word through whom the world is blessed, O word in whom all words are graced, do not bring us to the test. Give our claimant voices rest, and all the rest is silence. He's drawing on Jesus' words. What if? Jesus says, you'll give an account for every careless word. Did you catch that last line? O word through whom the world is blessed, word through whom all words are graced. I love that. Who is that? Who is the word through whom the world is blessed? This brings us lastly to the blessing of our words. The blessing of our words, Jesus says, is connected to the healing of our hearts. But who's got a word that can heal your heart? How's that gonna happen? What person in relationship on this earth can you look to that can give you the, just the right word that you most need to transform your heart? I have wonderful relationships in my life, but there's no human person that can do that for me or for you. The word through whom the world is blessed, John tells us in John chapter one, verses one and verse 14, tells us this, in the beginning was the word, that's the Greek word logos, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. He's the word, the living word of God. He, he's the word that, all your, that has all the words your heart longs for. I grew up uh, playing sports all my life. It was a huge part of my identity. When it was finally over, I struggled to figure out who I was. And all my life, when I was playing, and many years since, many, many years since, I have wrestled with the same issue. Longing for a coach, you know, or the, uh, someone to tell me I'm, that I'm, you know, that to, to achieve, to be good enough, to hear that word spoken into my life. And I wonder what the word is for your life, but there's a word, if you think about it, that, that would define what you most long for. Someone to tell you you're forgiven because you carry the wounds of past mistakes. Someone to tell you that you're free because you carry just the deep shame of things done to you. That you're good enough, that you belong, that you're acceptable, that you're beautiful. What would be the word you long to hear? And in all our life, we're clamoring for this word somewhere else, right? We're trying to get it through achievement, through accomplishment, through relationships. The, the message of the gospel is there's only one who has the right words for you, who has the word for your soul. And he is the word. In, in the gospel of John, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And when he comes to Peter, you might remember this story, Peter like, doesn't want to do it. Peter's like, I should wash your feet, not you mine. And Jesus says to him something fascinating. He says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I make you clean, you, you can't belong to me. Then Peter goes, well, give me a bath then. <laughs> and Jesus says, you're already clean. And then later in chapter 15, in the same discourse, here's what Jesus says. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The whole thing begins with, you're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Have you heard Jesus, the word, speak that word to you? The word is grace, calls you his beloved. You know, Jesus got the silent treatment from God on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took the, word, the cursing that we deserved so that we could receive the blessing of his words. He's the first word, he's the last word. <laughs> he's the whole dictionary, friends. And the only way my words are ever gonna be right I mean, you can be clever, you can be articulate, you can be eloquent, not that I am, but someone can be. But that's not the same as having the end of my heart healed. 
but I'm speaking to you from that place where Christ has spoken to me. That, that's when Proverbs talks about the power of life and death are in the tongue. The words fitly spoken are a tree of life. That's what he's talking about. To hear the word of God speak to your heart, the word you most need to hear. Let's pray. Father, we praise and thank you for your word. You, Lord Jesus, are the living word made flesh. And in all our lives, we're trying to hear some word spoken to us that'll tell us we're okay, that we matter, that we measure up. And you alone have those words. And you have spoken them to us through Jesus and through the cross. That we are acceptable. That we do belong. That we are loved. We thank you, Jesus, our word. And we ask that your spirit, you would help bless and strengthen our words. We pray it in your name. Amen. I'm going to close a little different this morning. Since we've been talking about the blessing of words, I want to speak a few words of blessing over a particular group, a couple of groups of people in here. This week, for most uh, communities in our area, school starts. So if you're a student, high school, middle school, elementary school, college, I'd like you to stand. I want to speak a word of blessing over you. Look around for a minute, those of you seated at our students represented here. Pray with me. Father God, we ask that you would bless these young men and women. That this school year would be one they would look back on as one that you were, had your hand on them in. Help them to grow academically, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally. Give them courage to speak the right words to their peers. Give them discernment. Give them strength, Lord, when they grow weary. Whatever they, you give them to do, in the classroom or out of the classroom, may they do it with all their might, working for you and not for the approval of men. We pray, Lord, that those around them would see your light shine through them and you would sustain them in this school year. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. And I don't want to miss out on our teachers. So if you're a school worker of any kind, faculty member, administrator, teacher, school nurse, lunch person, if you work in the schools, our schools, whether public or private, we want you to stand for a moment. Thank you, first of all, for serving our students so well. And hear this blessing now. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask for your wisdom and grace for each teacher and faculty member and school worker as they prepare to lead and teach each day. Equip them for every good work you have prepared ahead of time for them to do. We ask your strength would fill them. You would enable them to do all they do with a heart of compassion that comes straight from you. Give them ability and effectiveness and wisdom as they teach and lead. Fill them with creativity and passion for this critical role in the lives of young minds and hearts. Give them laughter and fun every day, but especially in times when they grow tired and moments when they feel there's just not enough time to do all they need to, multiply their hours, give success to their efforts, for we know that you are able to do much more with a day than we ever could. Remind them they have an incredible ability to make the difference in the life of a child and that what they do is important because they are playing a part of building our world through the next generation. Give them help when they're weary, grace when they feel they've reached the limit, Give them peace when they feel overwhelmed. Empower them by your spirit with energy enough to match even the most challenging student in their class. Remind them that more than representing a job or a school or a district, they represent you, Lord Jesus. And because of this, your spirit and covering are brought to that school every day. And this is a very powerful thing. Lord, we thank you for our teachers and our school workers. Bless them this year, we pray in your name. Amen. Now let's all stand together. Receive the benediction this morning. May the Lord God be gracious to you and lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. And may you hear him speak his word of grace over your life. Amen. And go in peace.